This is the Nielsen Norman Group UX Podcast. I'm your host, Therese Fessenden. On this monthly show, you'll hear interviews with user experience thought leaders about fundamental UX topics, common industry questions, and discussions on how great UX can truly transform the world. Today, I'm joined by Kate Moran, Senior UX Specialist with NNG. Kate's research spans a breadth of topics, and she's a pioneer in the industry for her research insights. From discovering new browsing patterns with eye-tracking research, page parking, tone of voice dimensions, and many other groundbreaking concepts. She holds a master's degree in information science from UNC Chapel Hill and teaches six certification classes on a number of different topics, including the topic of today's podcast, Return on Investment, otherwise known as ROI. On the show, Kate shares her insights from her latest research on benchmarking and ROI, what to think about when communicating the business value of UX, what to avoid when making metrics-based decisions, and how to ensure you're not letting the tail wag the dog, so to speak, by letting data make your decisions for your team, rather than having your team make decisions with the data. With that, I'm excited to welcome Kate Moran. Thank you for joining us. How are you doing today? What has been exciting? What have you been working on recently? Oh, I'm pretty good. You know, like like a lot of people have been hunkered down, but luckily work has been busy, so it keeps mm-hmm. me busy. Um, yeah, I will say also, I happen to have a English bulldog puppy sleeping next to me, and she is um, a big snorer, so you'll have to let me know if, <laughs> if that gets too loud. <laughs> um, Leo is my favorite. I will, I will let you know. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. um, so, yeah, you know, I, I feel like, like, I mean, you know, you know how it is like with NNG, we've always got so many things that we're juggling at once. So, um, but I've been really focused on reports, like in general this year, that's been kind of a focus, been doing a lot of like research and a lot of report writing. And so that's something I'm focused on right now. Yeah. So you've recently published one of them, if I remember correctly, the ROI report, is that Uh right? Yeah. It's called UX metrics and ROI. Um, And essentially, it is a big collection of case studies that describe how teams are using quantitative data in their day-to-day work. Um, So it's 44 case studies. And the really fun thing about that report is we've been updating it since 2006. So we've got legacy data going back to 2006 for how teams were improving their products and, and quantifying that and collecting these UX metrics. That's really cool. And I know for some folks, hearing ROI sounds like a foreign language. So I would like to, for the benefit of others listening, how would you define what ROI is exactly? Yeah. So the the report is kind of about two different but related things. And so the first kind of aspect of the report is about UX benchmarking. So that is just collecting, you know, some sort of metric that represents the improvement that you're making in the design, hopefully an improvement, usually an improvement, (laughs) but (laughs) so things like, you know, um, like time on task, like how efficient people are with the product, or it could be something that you get from analytics, like your conversions, or it could be returning visitors, just something that is a uh, numerical representation of some aspect of the experience. So that's kind of the first part of the report is we we break down how that process works, collecting those metrics, analyzing them. um, And we look at a lot of different case studies where teams were doing that. So then the second sort of part of the report is ROI, so return on investment. So that's sort of taking those metrics and showing how those metrics connect to business goals as expressed as KPIs or key performance indicators if that's uh, not jargony enough for you. <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah. Key performance indicators is, I, I think some folks may be a little bit more versed in those mm-hmm. in that it, it tends to impact a lot of people's jobs. Like yeah. certainly plays into a lot of people's, you know, uh, compensation or um, not just compensation, but like how well or not well the entire team is doing. Yeah. Well, that's, 
That's what KPIs are. They're from a business perspective. It's ways that you can sort of check in and see if the the company or the organization is meeting its goals. Um, and usually those are tied to revenue in some way. So a lot of times we're talking about like profit or, you know, cost savings. Um, and as you say, it is often tied to how people are evaluated and like whether or not they're going to get bonuses or <laughs> whether they're going to get a new hire that they need, things like that. Yeah, it can be pretty stressful, I imagine. And and for some of the folks, I, I imagine that you researched, uh, ROI must have been either something that went really well with the organization or stuff that stressed people out. So I, could you give people any advice if they were you know, trying to figure out how to quantify their impact, yeah. um, how not to lose their mind while doing it? <laughs> um, well, um, in that report, we, we have some um, step-by-step instructions for doing that. But essentially, the thing that I really like about looking at UX metrics and collecting ROI is that it requires you to think really deeply about what is the value of UX and then sort of express that through quantitative data. Um, so you have to understand, you know, what we we're, in most cases, we're not doing UX work because it's nice, right? <laughs> I, we might, you know, want to believe that that's why we're doing it. But in most cases, we're doing it because it makes sense, because it makes business sense. And in many cases, makes financial sense. Um, the problem is that a lot of teams don't do the work of actually showing that. They don't actually do the calculations. So, um, for example, McKinsey, about a year or so ago, they did a big survey of different design teams. And they found that over 50% of the design teams that they surveyed weren't doing that. They weren't quantifying their impact. And so, as a result, they had no way of showing how they were impacting the business. So the first thing to do is to think, you know, what what is the purpose of this product that you're working on? Or like, why does this why does this product exist? What what value is it offering for people? Um, you know, for like, let's imagine like, um, you know, an intranet. So why does an intranet exist to to help employees find information that they need to make them efficient, um, to help them get their work done and kind of support them. So, okay, so that's the value of an intranet. So like, what are the things that we could measure that would tell us whether or not it's doing its job? Probably a lot of efficiency things are going to be important. So things like time on task and also, you know, making sure people can find the information that they want and that it is the correct information, Um, you know, things like that. So there are UX metrics that we can collect that describe those things and help us assess um, how well is this design working now? And then once you start doing this over time, then you can look back and see, okay, how much how much progress have we made? How much better have we gotten now? Kind of like looking back. So that's yeah. kind of the first place to start. Um, and then with the ROI calculations, it's really about figuring out, okay, I have, I have these things, these like aspects of the experience that I've measured. And that's on one side. And on the other side, I have, uh, ROI metrics or KPIs, things that the business values. So to sort of oversimplify it a lot about making that conversion kind of almost, I like to explain it to people like converting units. Um, so taking the, the improvement in the design and showing how that is also, you know, something that contributes to cost savings, you know, that's probably what we would look for with something like an intranet. We would want to see, hey, look, we made people more efficient. We helped them do their jobs more efficiently. How much value is that really adding to the business? Got it. That makes a lot of sense. And and I'm glad that you're talking about it like converting units because I think people get very stressed about it and yeah. worry that if I don't justify this in just the perfect equation or if I don't get the value absolutely correct that you know, this may not be taken seriously. Um, But I guess, what are your thoughts on that? Are there things people should keep in mind or mistakes that people make when they calculate? Yeah, I actually- Or communicate ROI, I guess. Right, oh yeah. Well, I actually wrote uh, an article on that, on those um, mistakes that people often make when they're doing these calculations. I think part of the problem is that we call it ROI, to be honest, like if we could rebrand it and call it something (laughs) different, there'd probably be fewer confusion, there'd be less confusion. But um, 
I think the problem is that people hear ROI and they think, okay, this needs to be some super, you know, super accurate, super specific financial calculation. And the problem is that it will just never be that. It can't be that. We're trying to predict, you know, what human beings are going to do. Um, and, you know, like just the way that we do these calculations, it assumes that everything else in the world is going to stay constant. And we just don't know that that's the case. Like you could make huge improvements to an e-commerce site um, and calculate that, you know, it's going to translate to $2 million in added revenue every year. But then a huge competitor comes out of nowhere, you know, like Amazon decides to get involved in your product space, whatever it is. And yeah. all of a sudden, like, you know, that revenue is not there. So yeah. it, we have to understand that it's it's not a prediction. It's really a, a strategic exercise. Like sometimes I tell people to think about it like a thought exercise. It's really just trying to communicate what is the potential monetary value? And sometimes it's monetary. Sometimes it's not. Like sometimes you can just express something as like time saved mm. and that can be powerful. I think people need to remember we're not doing these ROI calculations because they're fun in those <laughs> cases. Um, we're usually doing them, you know, maybe to communicate to our stakeholders or our clients that we, you know, there's something we need to do. There's a redesign that needs to happen. There's you know, some change we need to make and it's going to be valuable. Or we're trying to, you know, maybe after the fact, we're trying to show those people, this is how much value we delivered for you. Or if you're in a leadership position, you might do these kinds of calculations to help you prioritize and say, look, I've got these six different UX projects I could work on. We're going to pick this one because it's going to be potentially the most value. Um, so we're always doing ROI calculations for a reason. And mm -hmm. so you should do as much work in that calculation as you need to, right? Does that make sense? Like you should do just enough to help accomplish your goal, but don't do more than that. <laughs> Got it. Okay. I like that idea partially because sometimes the thought of doing massive financial like predictions sounds terrifying, but yeah, you're right. It's a thought exercise. It's meant for us to strategize. It's meant to be a tool for us. And this leads me to another common theme I see in a lot of our conferences and classes that a lot of businesses kind of, for lack of a better phrase, fetishize numbers. When they strategize, they often obsess over these increased outcomes or increased performance at all costs. And sometimes I think about that, especially nowadays, you know, you, you see a lot of patterns that are somewhat dark patterns or nefarious design choices for micro conversions or just to get that additional 0.5% increase in in clicks. So, you know, I guess another question I would have is, you know, do you have any advice for how teams can stay growth oriented and avoid unethical behavior that might be incentivized by looking at these numbers or, you yeah. know, should we deprioritize some metrics or should we prioritize others? What do you think of this very big, complicated question? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, I definitely know what you're talking about. I've, I've definitely seen that like in the teams that I've helped um, and also just kind of the culture around metrics in UX can sometimes be toxic, unfortunately. Um, I think part of the problem is that when we start collecting these metrics, we can like the power can kind of go to our heads a little bit. <laughs> we can get a little excited about all the data that we can find, especially with tools like analytics, where it's so easy to just pick out all this information about what people are doing with your product in real life. Um, I think the problem comes in when teams let the metrics make their decisions for them versus mm. just looking at the metrics as, as a tool. Um, and I think there, I think there's a distinction here between using quantitative data to help inform design versus letting it lead design. Sometimes I think this can be like a, a cultural problem in organizations. It certainly seems to be something that's true of people in leadership positions. They tend to care a lot about the data, care a lot about quantitative data. And, you know, I, this is a sweeping generalization. Of course, there's <laughs> exceptions, but they tend to be you know, more impressed by the quantitative stuff. That's part of why I recommend UX teams get involved with benchmarking and with calculating ROI is so they can sort of speak the language of the business. 
Right. But but the problem really comes in when, as I said, teams are letting the data make the decisions. And also, I think when there's maybe too much emphasis on a single metric um, to the extent that we sort of lose sight of the bigger picture. So I, I have two examples for you. First is a, a non-UX example, and then I'll, I'll give you a UX example. So the non-UX example, if you remember a couple years ago, gosh, I don't know, was it five years ago? I'm getting so old. Uh, <laughs> five, 10 years ago, something like that. Anyway, so you might've heard about the Wells Fargo scandal that happened. Do you remember that being on the news? Somewhat, but if you could refresh my memory, since I'm also getting old, you know, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> um, yeah, so Wells Fargo, which for anybody who's listening who's not an American, this is a, an American bank, and they had a huge scandal a few years ago um, where it came out that some of the account managers were creating accounts for people without their permission. So they were creating these bank accounts for their customers without their knowledge. And the problem was that these people were being charged fees for those accounts. And, and also it's a violation of their, their privacy and security. So it was a, it was a huge scandal. Yeah. Um, and I remember reading about it at the time that the problem ended up being that the company was so fixated on one number on new accounts opened. I think it was like monthly new accounts was their metric that they used. Um, and they stressed it so much to the employees and they would fire people if they didn't meet those, those targets. So these, the, I know it, it was wrong of them, but these account managers were saying, all right, I'm going to have to either I get fired or I create these illegal accounts. So some of them were creating the accounts. So, um, that's just a really dramatic example, I think, of this this um, concept, this phrase that you know gets uh, thrown around a lot, which is what gets measured gets managed. So, mm -hmm. what we take the time to measure and to talk about and to use as a, one of those KPIs, that does have consequences on the real life decisions that people will make. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a, a non-UX example, but it's definitely true in the UX world as well. So let's think about a digital example. Um, there was a trend that came out. Now, this was a couple of years ago. I feel like it was like two years ago where we started to see these things that we call manipulinks, yes. which are... <laughs> I'm saying yes. I, I don't recommend manipulinks, but I'm saying yes, because I just remembered Kate's video. Yes. So <laughs> Kate and Kim recorded this fantastic video. Just uh, that's all I can say. Just look up Manipulinks and in group, you'll well, find Well, thank it. you. We had, we had fun with it for sure, at least. Um, so Manipulinks are these, our name for these little pop-ups that appear on, usually on e-commerce sites, sometimes on content sites. Um, but they're these little pop-ups that are basically trying to bully users into signing up for their newsletter. And part of the way that they do this is they'll have an opt-out link underneath that newsletter sign-up that says something like, um, no thanks, I don't like fun. <laughs> <laughs> no thanks, I don't like deals. Yeah. So the, the idea there is they're sort of putting words into the mouth of the user and like making them say something negative about themselves to sort of punish them for not wanting to give their email address over to this company. Now, obviously, from a UX perspective, where we care about long-term relationships with our customers, that's not ideal. <laughs> not. So the question is, how do these teams do this? And how are there so many of them? Like now, if you, hadn't, there. If you hadn't noticed this before, you're probably going to start to see them all over the place. I still see them constantly. I'm always finding new ones. I think what's happening is... I think these teams do see an increase in the number of people signing up for those newsletters when they use these kind of approaches. And some of some of the ones I've seen are really bad. They will, you know, not even make it clear that someone's signing up for a newsletter. They'll say something like, put your email in and you'll get 12, you know, recipes, you know, for cooking over the weekend or whatever it is. So they'll give you a, a little plug like that. And they don't make it clear that, yeah, you're going to get those 12 recipes. You're also then going to be subscribed to our, all of our newsletters forever. Right. So I think there's, there's in some cases, there's multiple things at play. But I think teams are seeing that those approaches, 
you know, they get results. They get, you know, a 12% increase in newsletter signups. <laughs> and, and if your boss is telling you, you have to get newsletter signups at all costs, then that might become your priority. Now, the problem there, obviously, is you're sacrificing your long-term relationship with your customer for a very short-term gain. And you're sort of bullying them into something they may or may not actually want or need. So I think there's a short-sightedness there. I think there's a, a lack of understanding the context there. And I think that's the danger with these metrics is they can't be the, the be-all, end-all. Mm. I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, looking forward into another bout of lockdown with the pandemic slash the next fiscal year, well, calendar year, I guess, you know, lower risk tolerance is probably going to impact a lot of UX decision making. I think everyone's kind of trying to prepare for worst case scenarios and it might get harder to innovate in that, you know, in this next coming year. Um, teams might err more on the side of safety or you may be keeping existing designs as opposed to trying to radically redesign or change things. So, you know, if if you have any advice, what would it be to help teams perform well, whether it's to meet those metrics or change their metrics, if, if that's applicable or, you know, what do you recommend to teams as we look forward to the next year? Well, um, that's definitely something that I'm pretty anxious about, I'm sure most other people are too, you know, nobody knows what's, what's coming in 2021. The vaccine news sounds really promising, but, and, you know, this is like an economic situation that nobody has seen before. So um, it is a, definitely a concern that, especially depending on the industry that people are, whatever industry people are in, some industries are going to be hit harder by this than others. Um, and I am concerned that some companies will start looking for places to cut their budgets. They'll start looking for places where they can, you know, reduce overhead and get some savings. And I'm concerned for those teams who haven't done this work yet. Those teams that haven't, you know, whether or not they're doing this in a quantitative way or not, if they haven't been making the argument, here's what UX delivers, here's why we're not a nice to have thing, Here's why we're an essential thing. I worry for those teams because I think that is where we might see um, a little bit of, of regression. So um, one of the things that I'm working on in addition to these reports is, um, I don't know how much I can say about this. It's kind of, it's kind of top secret, but it is related to um, our UX maturity uh, work that we've done in the past. So we love to study you know, how teams, how companies evolve and become more mature in terms of their approach to UX and of their approach to their relationship with their customers. Um, so that's one thing that, that we're working on right now, something upcoming related to that. But so it's very top of mind for me. And top secret. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is true that unfortunately, we, we don't see that teams always get more mature over time, that, that companies always get more mature. Like that's what we like to think about. We like to imagine that, you know, we're always working towards this end goal of someday every company will be <laughs> super UX mature and they'll understand that it's a necessity and value um, and valuable, but um, it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes there is regression. We see teams and companies that, you know, were more mature. And then for various reasons, there's there's some backsliding. Um, and that is one thing that I'm really anxious about in the coming year is I, I hope we won't see a lot of companies falling back in that way. But I think a, a important tool that can help people to fight that is trying to prove your value, trying to show the company that, you know, you're worth keeping around. This is not something that all, all teams have to worry about. It's um, really tends to be more of a tool that you need if you are a little bit lower in that UX maturity, if you feel like there isn't already an established understanding of the value of UX. But just last week, I was, I was helping this woman who um, works for uh, the United Kingdom's government um, she works on one of their digital products and she was like, you know, I'm really struggling with figuring out how to prove like the value of UX and I'm struggling to do this calculation. So I ended up like talking to her for a while and sort of probing a little bit deeper. And we ended up realizing she didn't need to do the calculation because, you know, 
their government already has a really high UX maturity. Like they already see the value. So this is not something that you always have to do. It's not something that everyone has to do or that you have to do forever. It's just, you know, one of those things in your toolkit for making sure that, you know, people understand the value of UX. Yes, <laughs> that is, that's some really nice advice as well. And, and yeah, remember that you, you're really doing this for your team and for the company you work for. And if you have that value known, then embrace it and keep chugging along, keep doing the good, the good work of UX. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, Kate, if anyone wants to follow you, can you point them to any social media or any related places to follow your work? Yeah. um, So you can always follow me on Twitter. I'm at um, my name, Kate Moran with two underscores in the middle. Um, Sometimes it confuses people. Uh, in retrospect, I probably should have just picked one underscore, but that's Kate underscore underscore Moran. Um, of course, you can always visit nngroup.com to check out our reports and our articles and, and all the videos that we mentioned today. Awesome. Thank you, Kate. Hope you have a great rest of your day and I hope we get to talk to you again soon. Yeah. Thanks, Therese. You too. Bye. Bye. For any of the resources we talked about today, check out the show notes for links and the report that Kate's been working so hard on. You can also subscribe to our weekly email newsletter where we share free articles and videos and upcoming opportunities to get a UX certification at one of our now virtual UX conferences. To learn more, go to nngroup.com. That's nngroup.com. Thanks for your support. Until next time, and remember... Keep it simple.